Hey, hey, hey. Hello, Touch Designer Summit. Um, so I'm David Bianciardi, and I do run a studio in New York called A, B, and C. And before I start, uh, really thanks to Greg and Isabel and the whole derivative team, derivative team for such an amazing gathering of people. I really have started to think of this as our community of practice, and it's really um, great to spend a few minutes sharing some thoughts about our journey at A, B, and C, uh, and see if there might be some re relevant snippets. Um, <clears throat> I'd be remiss if I didn't remark on how refreshing it is uh, to look out on this group and not see just a bunch of straight white dudes. And so it seems like this community really needs to be and seems to be at the forefront of welcoming and putting into practice a kind of diversity that I think is actually pretty core to the kind of, um, it's a core requirement for the kind of creativity and growth um, and equity that we want in our businesses and in our community. So, um, I hope you've had your fill of mind-blowing, beautiful, inspiring, deeply technical presentations because this isn't any of that. So it's really just a scaffold for the kinds of conversations that I'd like to be having with folks here and folks like us. Um, some food for thought as this community of practice again grows um, along with the opportunities that we have to do great work together. So the reason I'm going to start with a little introduction beyond Isabel's is so you can put some of my ravings in context and better judge if they mean anything to you. Um, you know, most of the time you ask somebody what do they do and you get a data point, um, a little single data point title or a, I'm an X of Y kind of title. That's great for a quick take, but it's pretty useless if you want to figure out um, how you share uh, perspectives with somebody. And uh, so maybe a Venn diagram is better. You get to see an intersection of skills and interests, influences but still no sense of direction where they're going with that collection of, of traits. So, you know, some kind of path or vector maybe is the way to uh, let you see how people have been built and influenced over time, what they're moving towards, see if a path uh, might be intersecting. Um, maybe you want to travel down the same road together for a little while. So, in as much as I want this to be a, a cross-pollinating kind of opportunity for myself and Others, uh, that's what I'm gonna do. So yeah, I started as a classical musician, um, moved on to composition. Maybe this was a little too executional, so I moved on to being a composer and um, having a little bit more agency, and that was really the start of lots of interdisciplinary collaborations. Um, scores for contemporary dance companies, uh, theater productions, et cetera. But, quickly moved away from strictly musical to more abstract sound design-y kind of stuff, and the shows were getting more and more complex, more and more technical. Um, so I started mixing around with making software and hardware so that these complex performances could be uh, controlled. And being able to make things talk um, to each other to kind of achieve designed uh, behaviors turned out to be super useful to, of all people, theme park people, um, which is very technically interesting and challenging, but pretty soul crushing if you've done it. Um, however, on a project in Japan, I met this composer, Ryan Oliet, who uh, Axel was just reminding me of, and we uh, dreamed up an idea for an immersive environment um, with real-time generative visuals and music that, you know, allowed participants to influence everything that was going on around them, and uh, amazingly, SIGGRAPH said they'd let us do it, and they give us resources and space, <clears throat> and that's when Ryan introduced me to his friend, Greg Hermanovic who was this mad scientist, side effects co-founder, um, using Houdini's preview mode to do uh, real-time visualizations um, for raves in his spare time. So that was Greg and my first collaboration, so we're talking late 90s. Um, looking back, actually, on the Interactive Dance Club, it really strikes me as a seminal moment for the approaches that have powered um, the last 20 years of my evolution. Um, and along the way, Derivative was born, and uh, so it was a natural progression for us to kind of become early adopters of uh, this touch designer thing. And along the way, we tried and failed to commercialize the IDC ideas in a company called Synesthesia, and we uh, got to play with musical robots, being a founding member of uh, Lemur. Some of them went on to tour with Pat Metheny. Um, getting involved in sort of new interfaces for musical expression and all the ways in which we could move away in the electronic music world from laptop concerts. Um, and uh, ultimately, bills had to be paid, and so I created this little company, which really just meant printing a business card. 
And at first, uh, you know, it was pretty understandable museums and interpretive designers who wanted to add digital media to their repertoire of kind of engagement techniques um, sought us out. Um, and at some point, brands woke up and said, hey, we're storytellers too. And they wanted similar help, right, engaging with their audiences. So now things have come pretty full circle. Um, we have a growing art practice where we have the privilege of serving our own uh, interests and ideas and inspiration instead of just uh, supporting other people's voices. And where we go next as a company is really an open question. And I think uh, the reason I'm sort of taking you through this little spiral journey is because I'm um, pretty confident the folks in this room and in this community are going to be a part of it. And I'm excited to keep uh, exploring that with you all. So a bit about this thing that has been growing around me. You know, we have the typical language. We do blah and blah at the inter intersection of blah, 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 blah. Um, but what it comes down to is we work in physical spaces and we try to add digital layers to those that bring them to life in some expressive or responsive way um, in order to essentially engage with and affect with audiences um, you know, in a transformative experience. Um, and you know, this is what it looks like. You can look at the website too. Um, but uh, most of it is permanent uh, installations, three to 10 years in market. Um, so you can imagine, especially since I see so many collaborators and current and former staff here, the kind of interdisciplinary team of curious and rigorous people that it takes to you know, experiment, design, code, engineer, build, deploy, support, um, this kind of work at scale. Um, so this talk is really kind of trying to be a bit of a state of the state uh, from the last 20 years of our journey. Um, our little corner of the world, our perspective. It's uh, not supposed to be an ad for A, B, and C, but uh, if you want to play with us, get in touch. And it's not a case study about our projects, but if you're curious about any of them, get in touch. And uh, we've got a crew here. We came as a posse, so uh, there's plenty of us around. Um, it's really more of a chance to get together and map out sort of what this growing industry, and it is an industry, uh, looks like from our vantage point in our company. Um, share some insights on how we're approaching the work in this evolving environment and hopefully spark some interesting conversations. So looking out at this landscape, um, you know, I really see it as an ecosystem. And as this community evolves, um, there are some patterns that I'm seeing about how this kind of work gets done. And I thought I would share some of those, uh, not because I've got the only version of this or it's the right version, but uh, just to, again, get some conversations going. And you know, what are the roles and relationships that allow this kind of diversity of expression that we're known for? This community has an amazingly eclectic um, way of expressing itself, right? Um, and by no means, again, you know, is this the only perspective, but uh, hopefully some of it resonates. And I think we all think of ourselves in different ways maybe. Some think of themselves as artists, as designers, developers, technologists. Um, I'm not sure where I fit on that. <clears throat> yes, that too. Researchers. Um, and we're collected in different ways, right? So we might be part of a company or uh, members of a collective or a studio, um, solo practitioners. Um, at the end of the day, this summit is you know, about people who are using uh, Touch Designer to create things. Um, so I think I'll start with the sort of software part of this ecosystem. And software and software people are obviously really relevant, but what do we mean by that, right? And it's like, oh, okay, well, we have some people, at least in my world, that are focused on frameworks and architecture and the kind of structural ways in which we want to organize the work. Um, we've got folks who are working with sensors and interactivity and all the ways that we want our environments to be sensitive to um, audience and users and what's going on around in the environment. Uh, generative and procedural stuff, obviously, I don't have to talk a lot about that, but that's sort of the expressive part of, um, of our work in a lot of cases. Um, but because we do these kind of environments that have a lot of things going on, we end up with um, this kind of middleware that's taking care of all the connectivity and the choreography and the glue between things. Um, and then there's always back-end stuff, 
CMS, content creation engines, whatever you have, it's the sort of like the infrastructure of the software. So even just within that word, we can unpack it into a pretty diverse little ecosystem of uh, talents and interests. Um, and that's the soft side of the world that I live in, and then there's the sort of the hard world, uh, the hard side, which is sort of, you know, could include physical computing, kind of board level sensors, actuators, awesome things like you just saw. Um, you know, the senses that we're activating are still, for better or for worse, primarily eyes and ears, so audio, visual is still a thing. Um, software's got to run on something, and usually the software that we're all working on tends to take a pretty uh, big chunk of uh, compute resources, so having folks around that can really design and deploy performant uh, computing systems is important to us, and they have a home in this ecosystem. Stuff's got to talk to each other, so whether it's you know living in a local or an internet connected or a cloud environment or some combination of those, which is usually typical these days. Um, Lighting, you know, we talk a lot about pixel rasters and resolution, but a lot of the time we're just using lights and other optical instruments as uh, material as well. So light as a material is important to us, and um, <clears throat> we like to move things around, even physical things. So, you know, having kinetic physical transformation is important. So electromechanically savvy people are a part of this mix. Um, all our stuff, at least at ABNC, I know there's folks that are working in VR and you know, good, but everything we do lives in the, in the built environment, so um, it's physical in some form, um, and because it's often building-sized, or in our case, it is a building, um, we can't just make it ourselves, so we have friends in the sort of general contractor and um, fabrication world uh, that we rely on pretty strongly. <clears throat> um, so a lot of us create all the content generatively, uh, and I know that that's a big part of what the power of a tool like Touch Designer allows us to do. But we also play back or manipulate or remix existing content. <clears throat> and a lot of people that come into this community are actually coming to it from a media production background. So, you know, they may be looking to extend their more manual um, techniques uh, procedurally, or they might want to move into real time uh, or get away from linear storytelling. Um, so, you know, we, we want film and photo and video and graphic designers and um, composers and sound designers in the mix as well, right? Um, and then again, you know, for a lot of us and always for AVNC, our work is experienced in a physical place in the built environment or in relation to some physical object that's being activated. And the design of those usually comes from architects and interior designers and sculptors and engineers. Um, and so we want them in the mix. And most of the time, even if we're doing something pretty abstract, um, and certainly when we're being paid by a cultural or a brand entity, we're in the business of storytelling uh, on some level. So depending on the project, the voices might be you know, curatorial or marketing and communications or an agency that's taken on a role on behalf of a client um, or a design studio that's leading an effort uh, from a nuanced aesthetic standpoint. Um, and, you know, who's all this array of talent being brought together for? Uh, unless you're an artist who's getting, you know, open-ended funding, there's usually someone in the project on, that's not you on behalf of who this work is being done. So, um, and whose interests we're serving. So, I'm not going to get into a ton of sort of detail here because A, you can imagine who we can serve. It's almost limitless um, and it's growing and it's uh, different for different people. Um, but, you know, okay, so far the roles that I've touched on are all pretty well understood, right? They're established disciplines. Um, they might be evolving to work together um, for the needs of this kind of work, but we kind of understand what they mean when they say, I'm a X. Which brings us to experience design, which is really a synthesis or a hybrid discipline. Um, and it's the newest kid on the block. Um, and, uh, you know, we can sort of think of it as a harmonic or, a, you know, it's created at the intersection of all these fundamental disciplines. And as the newest addition to the mix, of course, it's subject to a lot of euphemistic hand waving, and I'm guilty of that too, um, or attempts to co opt it by party planners or folks who are trying to sell more creative cloud licenses. 
but we do see it as an absolute core. It's the nexus, it's the bridge, it's the hub. Um, in our practice, it's the center of every project that we do. So we've been actually trying to actively increase the detail with which we define what's going on uh, under the hood there <clears throat> and uh, describe a kind of an XD-based practice. So the kinds of new processes required and the types of talents that are needed um, has started to become clear. And for us, you know, what lives here is, you know, overall creative direction and content strategy and visual design and the previs that we use to test out ideas or communicate possibilities, um, the 3D design that ultimately lands us in the physical world, um, the prototyping that makes sure we're not smoking crack when we have a wacky idea, um, <clears throat> the creative technologists and creative coders who are kind of the bridges between the hard, um, the hard science and the imagination side of the business, um, and obviously UX and UI. So that's kind of, you know, if we really understand this as the hub, or again, the nexus of the entire ecosystem, um, it is where all these eclectic disciplines around the, um, the core disciplines come for translation into the whole, right? So it's a way that we can have a bridge language, a lingua franca that can kind of connect us um, and give us all a sense of what, why are we doing this again and what's the goal, what's the sort of criteria for success and what are some of the possibilities if we take something from over here and something over here and we want to cross pollinate. So, um, you know, if we think about relationship and process, there's a space where maybe <clears throat> a series of relationships where the why of the project needs to be determined or some thinking needs to be done to figure out, I don't know, what kind of outcomes might be valuable or interesting or achieve the strategy of the client. And then there's obviously a series of relationships that resonate in a feedback loop on the uh, soft side of the project and a complementary one on the hard side of the project. And you can see, if I back up, that that XD really is in the middle of it. So. Um, at least that's how we interpret it. So if you agree with this map, um, and please don't, uh, you know, come up with your own, but if you do, perhaps you're thinking, well, who am I? Who do I want to be? What relationships and along what vectors do I want to build my practice? And if you're a solo artist, you might be responsible for all of this, right? We know a bunch of amazing people who sit in the box and do the whole thing. Um, a little harder to scale that, but um, if you're a subject matter expert instead, you might be going to go deep, deep, deep in one node. Um, that's super valuable too. If, like me, you're building a company, um, you might want to think about what parts of this ecosystem you want to inhabit. Um, you can be clear about your go-to-market, uh, who you compete with if that's your thing, uh, or who you might want to partner and collaborate with. Um, for us, you know, that ends up being sort of, you know, for instance, we found that we do our best work when we can kind of take responsibility for outcomes. And that means making sure that we have a lot of agency in terms of um, how this part of the work gets done, these three nodes. Um, and we also don't like being purely on the execution side. Um, in fact, we're no good at it. So we do have a core practice that historically has looked like this. And so we have a foot kind of planted firmly in these three lobes of, um, of the project. And increasingly as we grow and our clients look at to us more and more for sort of as a direct resource, <clears throat> we are finding ourselves uh, taking primary responsibility for leading some of the uh, other aspects, especially the storytelling and the physical design roles. So again, just, you know, obviously the point here is to roll your own, but um, it's just a way to think about it and, um, and maybe to start from this as a core because each one of these nodes has so many other nodes that it connects to and I think that's the interesting way to figure out your own vector. So that's kind of that. Um, I'm gonna blast through this stuff so we can chat about it maybe later. So one of the interesting things about building a business in this ecosystem is the kind of opportunities that we get, all of us, I think, to you know, create these amazing, oddball, weird-shaped, irrational, fragmented canvases that are hopefully beautifully integrated into their physical environments and have relationships to materials and architecture and all the things that we care about. Um, it's super easy these days, actually, to get clients to get excited about these kind of digital landmarks. I hope that's your experience. 
um, you know, they're seeing a lot more of them, and they want them. And uh, I can report that the C-suite FOMO is strong. So, you know, you can expect the phone to ring. Sounds cool, except if we actually want to take care of the client, we also have to ask them some tough questions, like, how are you going to feed this beast? And usually they look at you like, what beast? We just said we were going to make this awesome thing. Um, and they probably got some idea of what they want to do with this thing, but they haven't thought it through. And if we just sort of say, uh, just blast ahead, it doesn't make for long-term relationships because somebody's going to fall on their face. And you've got to help them do the math, and the math gets scary quick. So for example, um, you know, a typical thing that we do, 100 megapixels, right? Gigapixel. Um, odd shape, broken up in weird sizes, but weird, weird geometries, whatever. It's running at 60 frames per second. It's on all year. It's on all day. It's on all night. 9,000 hours of content. So at this point, you know, you're t telling this to a CMO who's uh, used to and not shy about spending a million bucks on a 30-second TV spot at 1080p five times a year. Um, but now you have their attention because um, if you don't have a strategy to mitigate this crazy downside, um, projects is dead, right? So great concept phase, see you later. So we've been introducing the idea of deep media, and I'll talk about this a little bit more here, um, as a comprehensive strategy to solve for that kind of brutal reality. If you spend seven figures of capital to make the canvas, and then it takes seven figures annually to feed it, um, and to keep it up to date and fresh and relevant and interesting and of the moment, um, that project is dead. Or it's gonna be shut down after six months and you've lost a great client relationship. Or your client is gonna get fired from their organization and you've lost a great client relationship. So the total cost over time just increases if you're thinking about the initial investment and then just feeding it with operating expenses, March getting budgets, let's go to the agency and have them create some linear media for us. Um, it's unsustainable. So the whole point of deep media is saying, yeah, we want to do this exciting thing, and it's strategically responsible. In fact, it's vital that we think about it as a platform um, that can renew itself and that can kind of be operationally sustainable. So, you know, so either the total cost in this traditional m mode, let's think like digital signage, put the TV on the wall, and then feed it with video. Um, so if you do it that way, the total cost over time just increases indefinitely, or you end up with somebody that says, well, we're not gonna change out the content, and it's stale and lifeless, and either way, it's gonna get shut down. So, you know, um, you were, learn words like TCO, total cost of ownership, and you wield it like the mighty sword that it is, because um, if you can truthfully say to a client that, um, hey, let's be strategic, let's spend a little bit more money up front, or a lot more money, but let's spend more money up front, um, create a platform, it's a visual instrument, your team will be able to constantly rejigger and manipulate and express themselves um, in authentic ways on this visual instrument um, and escape this hamster wheel of the flat media sort of OPEX addiction. Uh, then we're going somewhere. Then we all, then we can actually start to um, get their CFO excited because she's looking at this and she's like, oh, we're going to be revenue neutral in three years. Um, this actually works. So usually I talk a lot more about the particulars of what I mean by deep content or deep media, but this audience, obviously, we're all natives here uh, to this world, and so I'm really just trying to provide a different lens um, or a frame within which we can leverage what we already know, right? Um, so we'll take a few examples of what I mean. I'll go fairly shallow on deep media. And you can kind of um, think about how you might introduce these approaches to your clients if you're not already, um, as ways of ensuring really that the cool project goes ahead from you know, an awesome idea to uh, you know, what they want to hear, which is that it's a strategically valuable ROI generator. So one of the ways, and we can look at this, and you should feel free to just kind of, you know, put your own slides in here, because one of the ways that we've thought about it and that's worked a lot for us is curation and scheduling. So if you think about, again, that traditional, um, I mean, worst case example, let's just make fun of digital signage while we're here. 
Um, so somebody just bought a digital signage system. They've got you know 20 screens in their office building, and um, some poor bastard has to um, sit down at a computer every day and fill a playlist full of little chunks of 15, 30, one minute, uh, 15 second, 30 second, one minute videos. Um, all of those, by the way, had to be produced by somebody. Um, and let's say that that person instead is the manager of, uh, you know, is the, is the curator for uh, media in uh, 20 Victoria's Secret stores, to take a project of ours, for example. Um, so if instead you can say, you know, because all of a sudden now they've got stores around the planet and they want to do something different in the different hemispheres and uh, they want to do something different depending on what product they're trying to push or what models are licensed for different markets. If you start to go into a rule-based kind of approach to scheduling and curation, you can just say, well, why don't you tell me a story? What do you want the thing to do? Well, 10% of the time I'd like to show branding, uh, generative branding stuff, like those nice little particle systems you guys made. And 20% of the time, um, I want to do something about a specific product that's relevant for that market, depending on whether it's the winter in the northern hemisphere or the summer in the southern hemisphere. 20% <clears throat> of the time. The rest of the time, I want to do this, that, the other. And oh, by the way, when it's Ramadan at the Dubai Mall, we don't show body parts, right? We just make sparkly hearts happen. So if you can empower them to tell a story to the machine, then our sort of robot friends can go and figure it out and create that playlist for them. Um, you go one step further <clears throat> and you start to create a feedback loop where the machine is watching what the curator is doing and learning. And then it's maybe the machine that's starting to suggest um, what to surface and when. And the curator really becomes more of a sort of an approver and a, and a steering, um, steering the ship. So I think this is kind of one way to look at it. Um, I'm going to speed up a little bit here. Uh, content creation, this is obviously bread and butter here, but there's never going to be a day that I can see yet, um, uh, AI notwithstanding, that we're not going to want an artist to produce some media for us and obsess over every frame and live in After Effects for five days or 50 days. Um, but what they're going to produce is, 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 is not an extensible amount of content. They're going to produce this thing. It's gorgeous. We play it at noon every day. It's like Big Ben going off. Everybody knows to watch for it. The other 99% of the time, though, we need to think about what we're going to do. And so maybe we can take, like our client Cadillac, who has this amazing treasure trove of all their digital uh, photography of their design details, and we can remix it and surface it in different ways and collage it and kaleidoscope it. And all of a sudden, we've taken what we think of as latent assets that were sitting in the basement of the organization, and we've given them a tool to surface them and bubble them up in ways that are relevant to what they're doing that day, what their audience cares about. Um, and then, of course, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but generative, right? So we can just, oh, you're an organization that has a ton of data? Well, let's see if we can tell some stories visually with that. Or you want to be abstract? We can be abstract. So another way to think about it is sort of canvas migration. How many canvases can your um, content live on? Is it, is it stuck on the one that it was authored for? Um, and you know, that's, the answer is yes, um, it's fixed if you're in a sort of a traditional mode. But if we borrow a page from like web developers and we say, hey, what about responsive? Like I've got this rectangle, what if I want it to go into this rectangle? Well, there are rules for that, right? There's ways to have stuff, stuff kind of reformat itself. Um, but what happens when you go away from those rectangles and in one place you have a bunch of columns and in another place you have this big ribbon and over here you have these, this triptych of rectangles. Um, if we instead start to talk about uh, our canvases and our content and our layout rules parametrically, now you actually have a real sort of author once express yourself anywhere um, kind of approach. And that starts to become really valuable for enterprise, enterprise clients who maybe have a worldwide footprint of really heterogeneous canvases. So that kind of idea of being able to migrate through pr parametric reflow is something that um, may be a little counterintuitive to most people, not to you folks. Um, but that's one thing that we think about. So the last one I'm going to look at, but again, you could literally take any number of um, pain points and... Uh, and look at it through this lens of, of deep media. 
Um, so, you know, we've got engagement. Obviously, if you're just playing back videos, the most you're going to get away from passive is having creative rules in terms of the curation and the playlist. Um, as you start to get into real time, yes. um, you can be responsive. You can include sensors in your space. You can start to <clears throat> have the organism kind of re respond as, as part of the, the space that it's in and the people that are in it. Um, and if you want to, you can go all the way to interaction when it's appropriate. And some brands will want you to go all the way to transaction. So you can really think about this as a, a, as a lens. Um, whatever term you use for deep media, the point is to help drive the conversation into operationally sustainable uh, versions of the stuff that we like to do. We like to do this stuff, and we want people to say yes more, and we can equip them to say yes more if we make the business case. Um, and give them the ammunition, really, that they need to get buy-in uh, across their organizations. Um, and then we can rock out. So one last thing, and I'm going to tread super lightly on this, again, because I'd love to just have a conversation. Um, scale and scaling, I mean, there's so many ways to look at this, but one of the things that's really been um, kind of coming up for us is how do we scale our projects and our approaches when, you know, we have a a cool one-off for a client, and then they come back and say, but we've got 50 offices. Um, and without having to go back and kind of rewrite everything, um, you know, how do we scale our processes, too, so we can work in teams? I mean, you know, it's great to see, you know, Colin's workshop. I hope you guys, uh, some of you guys saw that. Um, uh, Matthew Reagan. I mean, there's so many great approaches these days to um, working in teams and working at scale within Touch Designer. Um, and I encourage our uh, hosts to encourage those initiatives. Um, and at least for some of us, we need to find a, a balance. Uh, for some of us, we need to find a, a balance between sort of modular reuse and, you know, those kind of software house best practices and um, the actual new custom work that makes us get up and out of bed and go to the office. Um, so, this is fairly self-explanatory, but in general at my shop, we're trying to find a way to preserve space for new and innovative and custom work. Um, and again, that's not just what motivates me, it's also what attracts people to come to work with us. So, it's important that we keep the exciting part going, even as we're trying to get sort of a little bit grown up on the periphery of the business. Um, but so to preserve that space for the innovative custom work and finding things we do over and over and over again and modularizing them, and then we can use those as an expandable kit of Lego box blocks, you know, that we can combine in ongoing interesting ways. But it also feeds two other sides. So on the flip side, you know, we're trying to productize things that we don't want to necessarily do, um, but people ask us to do, and we want to find a way to say yes. So how do we, you know, say yes to some of the less challenging, less interesting um, projects that nonetheless um, feed people. And um, as we move into enterprise environments um, and into the C-suites of bigger and bigger companies, how do we say uh, yes when they want us to um, expand over their global footprint and all of a sudden uh, we're like, this is great, but we have to rewrite everything because it's now being managed by a corporate IT department, um, and they all want them to work together and be managed by one person. And uh, so the thing to think about, though, is it turns out that this doesn't just apply to software, right? It applies to the way we organize teams, um, project teams, and the overall staffing of a company. It applies to the way we work with systems and, and hardware. Um, it applies to our process, uh, project processes. So the whole point is to make space to continue to do stuff that we want to do uh, without having to reinvent the wheel every damn time. Um, and uh, it's also a great way to build um, a team because you now have um, kind of gateway drugs for um, junior staff who are coming in, want to be a part of this kind of work, um, but need safe building blocks within which to contribute. So wish us luck, and uh, let us know how you're doing on any of this stuff. Um, and I think, you know, while I was making this deck, I realized that it should be thought of maybe less of, how, you know, what we want to be when we grow up and how we want to be. 
uh, when we grew up. But either way, thanks for listening. I apologize if uh, a lot of this was obvious to many of you. Hopefully, um, I took stuff we already know and kind of gave it a little frame um, that lets us have discussions. The whole point we're here is to learn, so um, I'd love to take some questions. And again, we're here in a posse, it turns out. Uh, Wina and Colin and Yun and Angelica are all here uh, from our shop. And uh, look us up, let's connect. Thanks. Thank you very much, David. I'm, uh, I'm inspired. Questions? Axel? Greg? Um, do you have any thoughts on your dependency that you feel you have on other technology providers? Because that corner is what you mostly occupy, you were saying. So how do you feel? Because like you, you, you might run into a project where you feel like, well, we should develop this kind of software or hardware. Just like, uh, well, some other people presented here, they make their own tools. So how, like percentage-wise, would you say like you're heavily dependent or do you really take on gladly like some tool development? So in terms of external partners who might be doing some of that, uh, that same work and, and are already a part of the project or want to be brought on? Well, you could feel like I, I just don't rely on other technology providers or very few because your criteria are very high or... so. I'll take a stab at that from, say, the, the, the system side of things, because you know, in everything that we do, once we're the first one to do it, then maybe it's not new the next time, or there's five other people that are doing it because they came to your talk. Um, so, the, um, so the idea is there's always going to be something that you're doing that's being commoditized. And uh, my approach has been to run away from that stuff and um, as fast as I can. But you can't just run away from it because we want to take responsibility for outcomes. We just can't have a good idea. There's a world full of just design companies that have good ideas. And then, it's, and then the realization is not something that they take responsibility for and we see the outcomes that happen there. So we want to take responsibility. So for instance, if we are on a big project and I don't want to have 100 people who are great at building racks and installing pixels, um, why would I go and compete with somebody who all they want to do is make a bunch of money doing that work? I want to make sure that I'm responsible for the idea, for the planning, for the process, for the project management, and then I can put just the special sauce, just some crazy engineer who's going to work with the crazy sensors that those guys have never seen before. So I think it's a question of figuring out what you want to be <laughs> when you grow up and getting away from the stuff that somebody else can do better and find ways of, of making partnerships and, and welcoming people who come in and say, hey, I, I have a great business that does this. And for me, it's like, oh, well, that's a big pain in the ass. So does that make sense? Okay. Uh, I, uh, my name is Greg from Derivative. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, no, I, 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 your talk was exactly um, why I wanted you to speak with us because it's first of all it's a real map of your real map of your brain. Oh, sorry, Isabel, I stole Isabel's idea. I thought it was a no, but once once Isabel suggested it, I said I I really want David here. Okay, is that right? Okay, is that better? You can okay, both take credit. We'll, we'll we'll sort it out later. Um, Isabel's idea. Um, okay, so, um, no, but the really, um, I, I've watched your company evolve over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, actually from, um, from interactive dance club days and so on, and, um, and you're, you, like, you're very analytical, you really break things down to, to systems, and, and there's a lot of parts, moving parts to it, and I realize how small a part uh, Touch Designer plays in this whole thing, because there's construction and there's all, but the threat is everywhere, but as a business owner, you have to, um, think of all these things and you analyze projects beginning to end in all those ways. So I, that's why I wanted the, the um, you know, our audience to have a look at uh, how you run a business and what you um, think of. So my, one of my questions is, um, uh, what, um, when you say, you talk about platforms, what, what makes you decide to build one thing and have it proprietary and not other things and that not to be proprietary? Because there are some things that you built, like conductor and so on, that is. And the tension between competition and collaboration is daily, right? Yeah. I mean, 
I think uh, our better instincts are to be a community and to sort of, you know, contribute to a tide that raises all, all boats. Um, ideally, and it kind of goes back to Axel's question, um, if you have a new idea today, um, then you don't have to be as precious about the idea that you had yesterday. Um, so then you can start sharing. Um, and in terms of, you know, I mean, there's so many instances, and I wouldn't minimize the role that Touch Designer has in our practice. A, it's usually the most visible uh, agent of our design. It's the thing that's actually creating uh, what people are experiencing in large part. Um, and also, it's, it works the way we think. So there's a kind of a, a natural mesh there between the way that we think and the people that I like to work with think. Um, so there's that. But for instance, you know, I can't remember, I finally met Selena in person this morning mm -hmm. in the hotel and uh, I was like, oh, you know, remember when we came to you, whatever it was, 10 years ago and we were like, we want to have WebKit in Touch Designer. And you were like, uh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and so in some cases, like, we'll, you know, um, work with you guys for features that don't exist, and maybe we'll, um, we'll actually pay for them. Um, and those then show up in the next build. So whether it's a week or a month or a year that I have access to that, well, I'm leveraging it. Um, if I wanted to do something proprietary, I'd, I'd have to go off and do all my own work. Um, so it's really just a question of, uh, you know, it's that startup-y kind of nonsense of first mover, like do what you want to do, do it first, and then don't be precious about it. All right. Yeah, good. Um. Ladies first. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for the inspiring talk. Um, I very in, in, uh, I want to hear about because you are organizing this. How many employees do you have? Thirty something. Thirty. Thirty something oh, okay. core staff. Although yeah. these days, what I've been doing is uh, looking at Slack because it's actually a much better um, measure of how many humans are helping push the ball up the hill. Right. Um, so it's more. It's like seventy humans, but right, about, right. Uh, you know. Yeah. Half, uh, a third or half of those are, are in-house. Yeah, so, okay, yeah, this is very interesting. I think you guys do such a, like a big, like a large scale works in that such a small team. And I'm actually also, you know, the, the company I work for at VT, I think we have grown kind of very fast. Maybe it was maybe 10 people full time. Now it's like 40, you know, in like a couple of years. And I think, it's sort of a decision that you, you probably make that how you want to you know, go about it because you can grow very fast, but that's a, always a risky move. But you can keep it small, but you kind of have to be very smart to be able to work with really, you know, really big corporations, right? Yeah. Um, and then, but I think I'm kind of interested in like internally. I think yeah, you guys seem to have like really nice um, sort of like environment for like the people who work there. And then, but I think like, I think it starts to like become kind of difficult when you have to actually have sort of a organization as a tree. You need a managers and then you need sort of, you know, senior, junior kind of situation. How, how, how much do you care about those titles? So I think there's, I, I'm gonna take your one question and answer it two sure. ways. I think the first question is, is scaling to meet demand. And I think what I've, in my experience, um, Growing happens unconsciously, like getting more people and more, more, more mouths that, need, that we all collectively need to feed each other with. Uh, but, but, you know, sort of, it almost takes more intention for me to make it right-sized. And that's an ongoing balance, right? And, um, and also shifting the, the mix, you know, uh, over the years, you know, we started really heavy down here and built this and then got to this and now we're realizing that we need to do those things. So it, it also shifts over time. And um, so for me, uh, I'm always trying to actually figure out a way to get smaller. Um, and it's not just for the business reason of like, oh, we keep more money. 
it's, um, it's really because I think at a certain point, the thing that makes us special doesn't scale. Um, there, that's a different talk, but there are some people whose philosophies I've been looking at about like, oh, how do you, how do you scale and how do you get to be um, more broadly available without changing the, the thing that makes your process special? Um, and in terms of the um, organization, I mean, talk to some of the folks that have worked with us, but I think it's a fairly flat environment. Um, we don't, we're not organized, for instance, like an agency. An agency has creative and production and account. Those are the three groups. And, um, and we're not organized in a super hierarchical thing. I mean, obviously we have people who are just coming in and learning the ropes, and we have people who have grown and have actually expressed an interest in being part of the, the group, maybe the leadership that, ha that helps me figure out where we want this ship to go. Um, as a sole ownership, it's, a, it's even more difficult. I don't have partners, I don't have a board. Um, it risks becoming a dictatorship. So, you, you know, you have to find people who also want to maybe um, have something to do with the design and operation of the organization as well as the projects. Um, so I think that, you know, having this kind of three main departments of experience design software and systems and making sure that um, also the projects aren't hierarchical. It's not like the experience design team goes in and do the first third of the project. Um, there's a whole another talk that I'll give you one day about process and just about how we change the conventions of design, bid, build um, projects um, where the people who are going to actually be responsible for making it aren't in the room on day one. That's a disaster. So yes, we have levels of seniority and people can grow through the organization, but it's usually not people, at least they don't come to work for us when they want to like grow up to be a manager. Right? Usually it's people yeah. actually making lateral moves or saying, ooh, you know, um, I used to be in the engineering department, but I want to create this new DevOps role that helps the systems and the software people deploy sanely. So um, it's kind of a um, choose your own adventure. Okay, guys, we have time for one more quick Itzard question. Was raising his hand. Itzard? Um, yeah, I was wondering, um, you told me you started with an interactive dance club, which was probably like, oh, you have a beautiful dream, we're going to build this. Do you find it difficult now that you've scaled so much, uh, the clients get bigger and, and often more corporate, I can imagine. Um, do you find it difficult to make beautiful stuff? I can imagine that sometimes clients come in and they have requests, which is not exactly a dream to build. or um, do you have some Tell us more about that. Yeah, no, I don't know. But do you have some, <laughs> what is your, do you find it hard or is it an easy? Um, so compromise is part of the deal, right? So um, for instance, we've worked on a project recently where, um, you know, there are some brutally pragmatic aspects to the project. Um, what was, what was an interest and continues to be interesting to me about the Sotheby's work is that we've convinced somebody who hired Rem Koolhaas to design their new building to add tasteful digital layers into this space that was perfect to begin with, um, that houses incredible objects, that has this collection of metadata-rich assets about those objects. Um, and yeah, they need to tell you that the you know salt and shaker salt and pepper shaker sale is on the third floor, but we also get to introduce them to the idea of like, hey, what if we had a machine learning process that crawled your library and and allowed your curators to kind of express themselves more fluidly? So I think there's always a question of like, what about a project is a keeps the doors open, b allows us to bring in all the friends that we want to work with and C, um, allows us to advance our interest, the interest that we have in our practice. Um, so it's almost like using them as an excuse to do what we want. And yeah, you do have to tweak fonts. Hi. Uh, hey. So small question. You're talking a lot uh, about being in the same physical space. 
and I just want to know what's your opinion regards uh, remote work, working with people uh, remotely, mm -hmm. and distributing uh, work that's not in the same physical space. Yeah. Uh, currently, and how you gonna? Uh, what's your? What? Where do you think it's gonna go in the future? Uh, your point of view uh, regards that. So. I, I a bunch of different ways to look at that, and I'm going to wait for Isabel. You're just going to kick me out of here, right? So, um, all right. There's a few different ways to think about that. First of all, no, we couldn't do the work that we do. Um, a, we have an office. We pay Manhattan rents. I can't have more than 6,000 square feet in Manhattan. It's just stupid. So at a certain point, um, you need to use the network and use it as a network. Um, and I would say that we're getting, so there have been some super ex extreme examples of that. Like we did this idiotic slash great project um, a bunch of years ago for um, Verizon for their Super Bowl activations. And it was crazy. And we had to, um, you know, these guys will tell you, we had to literally have a 24-hour work cycle where we passed off parts of the project to San Francisco and Hong Kong. And it was, you know, this 24-hour around the world kind of effort, and to do that, you need to um, structure the project a certain way and structure the teams a certain way. Um, but you can only do that if you trust people, and so um, that limits the number of people that you can collaborate with. Um, and uh, what we've also done recently is uh, started experimenting with people who aren't based in the office. They're based at home. They're based in other cities full time. So um, it's really about how do you maintain uh, team spirit and cohesiveness and the kind of intuition that people have about each other. Um, depending on who you ask, Slack is great or terrible or both at doing that. Um, I think it really comes down to a project management culture um, where they see themselves as kind of connectors and enablers as opposed to enforcers um, and to the kinds of people that you work with. Um, and some people are willing to work from Czechoslovakia on New York hours, and some uh, you wake up in the morning and there's a new, a new commit to look at. So, yeah, I think so. I just, I mean, my vision is that there are no barriers between us collaborating with anybody we want to and hopefully not, you know, shitting air pollution everywhere. No more summits. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. Thank you. I'm sure we can keep talking about this.